Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, this is the season of thanksgiving. We have so much to be grateful for. And for us who are followers of Jesus, it's not just a day or a week or a season. You tell us to be thankful all the time. We have so much to be thankful for. Your grace, your mercy, your love, just to know you as our God and to know Jesus as our Savior and to be dwelt and dwelt by your Spirit. Lord, what a privilege, what a blessing. Help us to have grateful hearts. As we were discussing in Sunday school, sometimes it's easy for us to be critical or complaining or gossiping. But Lord, I pray, as the psalmist said, set a watch over my lips. Keep my tongue from speaking evil and my lips from speaking guile. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength, my rock, and my redeemer. Father, as your word goes forth today, we know that it will not return to you void but it always accomplishes what you sent it to do. So have your way in our hearts and in our minds and in our lives. We pray in Jesus' name and for his sake today. Amen and amen. God is good. And all the time. Amen. I'm so glad you're all here today because I've just received the latest forecast for your Thanksgiving Day festivities. Turkeys will be thawed by Thursday morning. And they will warm in the oven to an afternoon internal temperature of 170 degrees. The kitchen will be hot and humid. And if you bother the cook, be ready for a severe cold shoulder. During the late afternoon and evening, the cold front of a knife will slice through the turkey, causing an accumulation of one to two inches on your plate. Mashed potatoes will drift across one side while cranberry sauce creates slippery spots on the other. An indigestion warning has been issued for the entire area with increased stuffiness around the beltway. During the evening, the turkey will taper off to leftovers, dropping to an overnight low of 40 degrees in your refrigerator. There you have it, my friends, the latest forecast for your Thanksgiving day. Last week, I focused on the why, when, and what to be thankful for. Today, I want to take you back thousands of years to an old-fashioned Thanksgiving celebration. When you saw the title of today's sermon, you probably were thinking pilgrims. No, I want to take you all the way back to the Old Testament. The books of First and Second Chronicles records the history of Israel's kings and prophets. In First Chronicles chapter 16, you will see that the Ark of the Covenant, which symbolized the presence and the glory of God, was brought back into the center of Jewish life. David was a godly king at this point, and he led the people to worship God with all of their might because they possessed the Ark once again. So you might wonder, what happened that they didn't possess the Ark, and how did they get it back? Well, before we get to that old-fashioned Thanksgiving service in Jerusalem, let me share with you a few things about the Ark of the Covenant because some of you only know about the Ark of the Covenant from the Indiana Jones movie, Raiders of the Lost Ark. As a matter of fact, this is a picture taken from the movie set, Raiders of the Lost Ark. So as we think about the Ark of the Covenant today, the first thing I want to bring out is the glory of the Lord because that's what the Ark represented, the glory of the Lord. The Ark of the Covenant of the Lord was the most significant object in Old Covenant worship. It was a box. It was overlaid with gold inside and out, and it was located in the most holy place, also known as the Holy of Holies. 
When the high priest would sprinkle blood on the ark once a year, the glory of God came down and rested above the mercy seat between those cherubim. Back in the book of Exodus, after God gave Moses the law, he then gave him very detailed instructions for building the tabernacle and everything that was to go inside of it. There was a man named Bezalel. He was filled with the Holy Spirit and gifted with craftsmanship to build the Ark of the Covenant. Now, the original measurements were in cubits, and since we don't measure in cubits anymore, the modern-day measurements for the Ark was about four feet long, about two and a half feet wide, and two and a half feet high. And God instructed the Israelites to keep three certain items inside. Let me show you from the book of Hebrews what those items were. Now, even the first covenant had regulations for worship and an earthly place of holiness. For a tent was prepared, the first section in which were the lampstand and the table and the bread of presence. It is called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a second section called the most holy place, having the golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant covered on all sides with gold in which was a golden urn holding the manna, an errant staff that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. Above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. When the tabernacle was built, the Ark of the Covenant was placed into the most holy place, the Holy of Holies. Once a year, on the Day of Atonement, Only the high priest was permitted to enter that small windowless enclosure to burn incense and sprinkle the blood of the sacrificial animal on the mercy seat of the ark. There he would atone for his sins and for the unintentional sins of the people. Each one of those items inside the ark had a special purpose. Think about it. The tablets were there to remind them to obey God's holy law. The jar of manna reminded them of how God provided food for 40 years in the wilderness. An errant staff that budded reminded them of God's miraculous deliverance from slavery in Egypt. Now today, looking back in hindsight, we know that that ark pointed to Jesus. Amen. He is our great high priest. Can you say amen this morning? Time for y'all to wake up. You got to say amen every now and then. Help a brother out. He is our great high priest. Amen. He entered into the most holy place once and for all by means of his own blood, thereby securing our eternal redemption. And through him, we have access to the holy throne of God anytime we want. Can you say amen to that? So you might be thinking, what happened? What actually happened to the ark that the Israelites needed to get it back? So let me bring up my next point. The glory has departed. In Hebrew, it's Ichabod. That's what it means. The glory has departed. And that's what they said when they lost the Ark of the Covenant. You got to go back to 1 Samuel chapter 4. The Philistines had defeated the Israelites in battle and killed 4,000 of their fighting men. So the Israelites got this bright idea. Hey, let's take the Ark of the Covenant into battle with us because it represented the presence of God to them. Well, it didn't help. It didn't help at all. Scripture says it was a very great slaughter. Israel lost 30,000 foot soldiers in the battle that day. And what was even worse, the Philistines captured the Ark of the Covenant. The Philistines, they probably thought that the Ark of the Covenant would bring power to them. But just the opposite was true. It's kind of humorous what happened next. The Philistines, they took the Ark of the Covenant back to one of their cities, Ashdod. And they placed it in their temple next to the statue of their pagan god, Dagon. When they got up the next day, they found Dagon's statue face down in front of the Ark of the Covenant. So they stood it back up, only to find it face down again the very next day. But this time, his head and his arms were broken off. Now, in addition to humiliating the Philistines' pagan god, God afflicted the people of Ashdod with tumors and a plague of rats. Can you imagine that? A plague of rats. Ugh. So, of course, they decided we got to get rid of this thing. So they sent it to the city of Gath. And if that sounds familiar, that's where Goliath was from. 
But when they did, then God afflicted the men of Gath with tumors, so they sent it away again. And we pick up here in 1 Samuel chapter 5, verses 10 through 12. So they sent the ark of God to Ekron. That's another one of their Philistine cities. But as soon as the ark of God came to Ekron, the people of Ekron cried out, they have brought around to us the ark of the God of Israel to kill us and our people. They obviously heard what happened in Ashdod and Gath. They sent, therefore, and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines and said, Send away the ark of the God of Israel and let it return to its own place, that it may not kill us and our people. For there was a deathly panic throughout the whole city. The hand of God was very heavy there. The men who did not die were struck with tumors, and the cry of the city went up to heaven. This went on for some time. And after seven months of suffering, the Philistines called their priests and their magicians to figure out what are we going to do with this ark. So they decided to send it back to Israel along with a guilt offering. Their guilt offering was five golden tumors and five golden rats. God providentially saw that the ark returned to Israel. So now let's look at the glory and how it was returned to Israel. The Ark of the Covenant was finally sent back to Israel. But it wasn't without incident. Many people died in the process. Either because they looked inside of it or because they touched it. That's how holy the Ark was to God. You don't profane holy things, amen? The Ark of the Covenant of the Lord actually ended up at the house of Abinadab for over 20 years before being properly transported back to Jerusalem. So now we come to this old-fashioned Thanksgiving service that I want to talk to you about in 1 Chronicles 16. King David and all of Israel had this huge celebration because the Ark had finally come home. Scripture says the Levites wore fine linen robes and properly carried the ark on poles. That's who was supposed to carry it, and that's how it was supposed to be carried. It says that King David wore his best fine linen robe and a linen ephod. And he leaped and danced before the Lord with all of his might, so much so that his wife despised him. And so all of Israel gathered together and they brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and sounds of trumpets and cymbals and loud music on harps and lyres. First Chronicles 16, the first three verses say this, and they brought in the ark of God and set it inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And they offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before God. And when David had finished offering the burnt offerings and the peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord and distributed to all Israel, both men and women, to each a loaf of bread, a portion of meat, and a cake of raisins. So after the ark was brought back, it says they offered burnt offerings and peace offerings to God. Now, the burnt offering was the highest expression of worship as the entire offering was consumed by fire. After the peace offerings were made, part of it went to God, part of it went to the priest, and then a portion was given to families for a three-day Thanksgiving celebration. This was a time of great consecration and fellowship with God. It was also a great barbecue meal for all the people. As far as I know, there wasn't any turkey served, and there probably weren't any football games included in the celebration. So it says that David blessed all of the people in the name of the Lord, and he distributed to all of Israel, both men and women, each a loaf of bread, a portion of meat, and a cake of raisins. Sounds pretty similar to our Thanksgiving, doesn't it? I mean, we eat bread, we eat a portion of meat, turkey, and then some dessert, pumpkin pie, sweet potato pie, whatever. But it says that all Israel was there. Think about that. There was probably enough people there to fill Arrowhead Stadium or maybe even more. And they must have sacrificed many, many animals and baked many loaves of bread and cakes for everybody to be able to get a portion. 
So David then assembled the Thanksgiving worship choir and orchestra. Let's pick up in verse 4. It says, Then he appointed some of the Levites as ministers before the ark of the Lord to invoke, to thank, and to praise the Lord, the God of Israel. Asaph was the chief. Second to him were Zechariah, Jael, Shemiramoth, Jehiel, Mattathiah, Eliab, Benaiah, Obed-Edom, and I guess this is another Jael, and they were to play harps and lyres. Asaph was to sound the cymbals, and Benaiah and Jehaziel, the priests, were to blow trumpets regularly before the Ark of the Covenant of God. Then on that day, David first appointed that thanksgiving to be sung to the Lord by Asaph and his brothers. I'm glad our names today aren't that difficult to pronounce. <laughs> but they did more than just eat at this Thanksgiving celebration. Because the ark, remember, it represented the presence and the power and the glory of God in their midst. So David appointed some Levites as ministers before the ark of the Lord. It says to invoke to thank and to praise the Lord, the God of Israel. And obviously, their praise was loud and jubilant. I know some of y'all think our worship team is loud, but you ain't heard nothing like this. Their praise was loud and jubilant. There was a huge worship team with lyres and harps and cymbals and trumpets. Their, their music was filled with songs of thanksgiving sung to the Lord by Asaph and his brothers. David's worship team was there to help the people do those three things. They were to invoke the Lord. In other words, they were to pray. They were to lead the people in thanking the Lord. And they were to praise the Lord, the God of Israel. And then when you get down to verse 8, that's the beginning of David's song of thanksgiving to the Lord. Verse 8 says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the people. Give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the people. Sing to him. Talk about him. Glory in his holy name and remember what he has done. He lists in this song of thanksgiving a remarkable number of ways that you can praise and glorify God. Now, some of them speak directly to God, sing psalms to him. Some speak to others about God's greatness, make known his deeds among the people. And some are reminders for us to be grateful, remember his marvelous works which he has done. It's interesting, the Hebrew word for thanks means to throw or, or to cast. It refers to the openness of the hand after it has thrown something. The idea is that we lift up holy hands to God because we've pitched our praise to him, amen? Amen. To call upon his name means to cry out properly with reverence. And then he says, make known his deeds among the peoples. That reminds us that we are to be faithful witnesses for the Lord. Amen? Amen. Telling others the goodness of the Lord. Scripture says you've been given the message of reconciliation and the ministry of reconciliation. Verse 9 says, sing to him. Sing praises to him. Tell of all his wondrous works. You see, once you understand all that God has done for you, you can't help but break out in song to him. Amen? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Tell of all his wondrous works. Listen, it's a great thing to tell people about your church, your pastor, the sermons you hear, the singing and the fellowship. But the best thing is to tell people about God. Amen? Tell about the wondrous works of God. Anybody here experience the wondrous works of God? Amen. Why don't you tell somebody about it? Verse 10 says, glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. That word glory means to boast or to shine. Think about what the scripture says. Let him who boasts, what? Boast in the Lord, amen? And then he says, let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. That means to, to brighten up, to be joyous. And then verses 11 and 12, seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. Remember the wondrous works that he has done, his miracles and the judgments that he uttered. That's what Thanksgiving's all about, y'all. Give thanks, amen? Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the people. 
Sing to him. Talk about him. Tell others about him. Glory in his holy name. Seek his face and remember. Remember. You must never forget the wondrous, marvelous works that God has done for you. Can you say amen to that? We must pray. We must praise. We must proclaim our gratitude to the Lord. We must boast about the goodness of the Lord. We are to thank him for who he is and for all that he supplies. Can you say amen to that this morning? At the end of this chapter, David says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, his steadfast love endures forever. Think about it. God is our banner. Amen? He is our provider. He is our shepherd. He is our righteousness. He is our sanctifier. He is our healer. He is our peace. He is our Lord of hosts, the omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent God, the most high God is whom we praise. Can you say amen this morning? David and all of Israel held a three-day Thanksgiving celebration because they had the ark which symbolized the presence of God. Now think about this. Their high priest could only enter the Holy of Holies once a year, sprinkle blood on that mercy seat to atone for his sins and for the unintentional sins of all the people. But the ark pointed to Jesus. Do you realize that? The ark pointed to Jesus. Can you say amen? Amen. Jesus is so much better than the ark of the covenant. That's what you read about in the book of Hebrews. That's what it's all about. Jesus is better than the angels. He's better than Moses. He's better than the Ark of the Covenant. Jesus is better. Amen? Amen. He's so much better because he is our great high priest. He is the one who gave his body as the perfect sacrifice on the cross to pay for our sin debt. Poured out his blood on the cross to redeem us. Amen? And he entered into the most holy place, Scripture says, once and for all by means of his own blood to secure our eternal redemption. You ought to say amen to that this morning. Thank God that through Jesus, we don't have to enter into the holy place once a year. We can go there anytime you want. Can you say amen to that? God reminds us over 130 times in the Scriptures to be thankful. Over 130 times because he knows our frame. He knows our tendency to easily forget how much he's done for us. Sometimes we complain without even thinking. And we have to catch ourselves. Honestly, we got nothing to complain about. Amen? Amen. We have nothing to complain about. Gratitude, thanks, and praise should continually flow from your mouth. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the people. Sing to him. Tell others about God and how great he is. Glory in his holy name. Seek his face forevermore and never forget Always remember the wondrous deeds which he has done. That, my friends, is what Thanksgiving is all about. Let the church say amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we know that you are a good God. All that you do is good. All that you allow in our lives is for our good and for your glory. But Lord, sometimes when things don't go the way we think they should go, we complain. We have this tendency to murmur and grumble. Forgive us for that, Lord. Help us to continually have praise as the fruit of our lips. We're so blessed. As I said last week, here in America, we're richer than 75% of the people in the world. But moreover, we have you as our God. We need to be thankful because you're the one that pursued us. 
You are the one that chose us. You are the one that saved us. It's not because of anything we've done, as the scripture says, not because of righteous deeds which we have done, but according to your mercy you saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. We don't get to heaven by our good works. It says we're saved by grace through faith. That all comes from you, Lord. So we thank you for being our God. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the presence of your abiding Holy Spirit. We have so much to praise you for. Father, help us not to limit our thanks to a day or a week or a season, but to be grateful people always. You know, it's hard to be thankful and and be complaining at the same time. So Lord, help us to always remember who you are and to give you the thanks and the praise that you rightly deserve. We want you to be glorified in our lives. We pray all of this in Jesus' name and for his sake today. Amen and amen.